Hello, hello, I'm Malik. I'm Jamie. And this is World Gone Wrong, where we discuss the unprecedented times we're living through. Can your manager still schedule you for night shifts after that werewolf bit you? My ex-boyfriend was replaced by an alien body snatcher, but I think I like him better now. Who is this dude showing up in everyone's old pictures? My friend says the sewer alligators are reading maps now. When did the kudzu start making that humming sound? We are just your normal millennial roommates processing our feelings about a chaotic world in front of some microphones. World Gone Wrong, a new fiction podcast from Audacious Machine Creative, creators of Unwell, a Midwestern Gothic mystery. Learn more at audaciousmachinecreative.com. Find World Gone Wrong in all the regular places you find podcasts. I love you so much. (laughs) I mean, you could like up the energy a little bit. You could up the energy. I actually don't take notes. Ah! (laughs) (laughs) That was good. (laughs) I'm just kidding. You sounded great. So did you. (laughs) Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Okay, pop quiz. What is America's national bird? Easy, right? The bald eagle is shorthand for America in popular culture. How about New Zealand? What about the Bahamas, India, and Mexico? The answers, all iconic in their own right, are the kiwi, the flamingo, the peacock, and the golden eagle. Now what about Canada? What's our national bird? Is it the ornery Canada goose? Seems the obvious choice, right? Canada is right there in the name, and pretty much every Canadian knows that signature honk and notorious hiss. Or what about the elegant loon? It's been featured on our beloved $1 coin, known as the loony, for over 30 years, and many of us are familiar with its haunting call. It's a trick question, actually. Officially, Canada has no national bird. For most of our history, Canadians have been satisfied to let one animal, and one animal only, shoulder the nation's symbolism. The noble beaver. The country was largely built upon the back of the continent's largest rodent as the foundation of the fur trade and the chief ingredient for sating Europe's appetite for silly hats. An act of parliament in 2002 made the Canadian horse our second official animal, but the government showed no interest in adding any of the avian persuasion. Then in 2016, with the nation's 150th birthday on the horizon, the Royal Canadian Geographic Society tried to change that by declaring that the bird then known as the Grey Jay should be our newest national emblem. The announcement ruffled more than a few feathers. At the time, few people had even heard of the Grey Jay, or Canada Jay as it's known today. It tends to stay in the boreal forests of Canada, in our provincial and national parks. And it's not the most iconic bird by any means, especially compared to other contenders like the loon and snowy owl. It's a bit smaller than a blue jay, but a bit clumsier in flight. Adorned with mostly ashy grey feathers, it's almost the definition of lackluster. They're adorably cute with their shiny black eyes, fuzzy white bellies, and oversized tail and wings, but they lack the impact of, say, a screeching bald eagle. But all that said, the society, led by the efforts of Dr. David Bird, yes, that's his real name, had several compelling reasons for their choice. For one, the Canada Jay lives almost exclusively in Canada, in every province and territory. It's found nowhere else on Earth except for a few of the northern states. And it's here for good. It doesn't migrate. The Canada goose likes to spend its winters vacationing in sunny California. The loon hightails it to Mexico and Florida. But the Canada jay toughs it out here, like the rest of us, happily laying its eggs in minus 30 degree weather. That's why it's been known as the Canada jay for over two centuries, except for a dark period between 1957 and 2018, when a classification error changed its name to the Grey Jay with, are you sitting down? Grey spelled the American way. Other winning traits are its intelligence and friendliness. The Canada Jay is a member of the Corvidae family, along with crows, ravens, and magpies, and it's just as clever, curious, and resourceful. I think Dr. Bird summed it up best when he said, quote, It is friendly, smart, and perhaps most importantly, hardy. 
And what is more Canadian than that? End quote. In all, the supporters of the Canada J present a very convincing argument. But if I could add one point to help make it even stronger, it's this. Look to the folklore, to the tales that people have been sharing around the campfire for generations. If you do, you'll find that the Canada Jay is a bird of many names and many stories. You're listening to Fireside Canada, my podcast about Canadian legends, lies, and lore. I'm David Williams. I have a few stories to share with you tonight, all from different parts of the country. Yet they share one key element. Each features the same special bird. Contrary to what you might expect considering its tiny size and unassuming appearance, this little grey bird has a colourful history and has made an oversized impact on a number of cultures across Canada, from the first people of the Upper Yukon to the settlers of southern New Brunswick. It is a camp companion, a hero, a hunter, a star in the sky, and even a vessel for the souls of the dead. These are the many names and many stories of the Canada Jay. Imagine it's a bright winter's day. You and a few members of your family are out exploring the snow-quiet expanse at the edge of a forest. You listen to the whine of your snowmobile and feel the crisp air on your face as you zip across freshly fallen powder. After a time, when the hazy sun is at its zenith, you decide to break for lunch. The motors growl to a stop, and you find a suitable spot at the end of a fallen log jutting from the tree line. The forest is so silent that the sound of an unzipping backpack feels as sharp as a chainsaw, the crumpling of your brown paper lunch bag as jarring as a tree fall. You're about to take your first bite when a new sound pierces the air. It's the curious chirp of a bird that has suddenly appeared in the branches above you. Moments later, it alights on a twig to your left. It's small, gray and white, with a little round belly and glossy black eyes. It gives an inquisitive flick of its head and eyes your sandwich with interest. Suddenly, an oval flash of orange cuts through the air and smacks the tree, narrowly missing the bird which quickly escapes to the treetops. You look down and see an orange peel lying in the snow, then trace its trajectory back to your younger cousin, who sits smirking atop his snowmobile. Before you can say a word, your grandfather is wagging a stern finger in the air. The grave tone of his voice makes it clear that your cousin has just made a serious mistake. Never do that again, he snaps, loud enough for everyone to hear. That's a meat bird, he says. Show it disrespect, and you'll get bad luck. Now something bad will happen before this day is through. Just you wait. It seems like a silly superstition, but no one's laughing. You all gaze up at the bird that is now carefully watching you from its perch. Your cousin wordlessly retrieves his litter while your grandfather tosses the bird a few nuts as reparations. You eat in silence for a while until someone thankfully shifts the conversation to other matters and the mood improves. Everyone has forgotten the incident by the time lunch is over until your cousin tries to start his skidoo and the engine refuses to turn over. No one says it outright, but you're all thinking it. This was the bad luck your grandfather had predicted. As you tow the machine back home, you hope that a dead engine is the extent of the repercussions, and you make a mental note to show a little more respect to the wildlife of the northern woods. This belief that disrespecting or harming a Canada Jay will bring bad luck is somewhat common in Canada. You might have even heard it yourself. Personally, I've come across it in Newfoundland, the Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. It's one of those things that the older folk tends to share, but only when it comes to mind, and routinely without a story. It's often just a thing they know, up there with black cats and broken mirrors. 
But unlike those examples, which are hundreds if not thousands of years old, this particular superstition about this particular bird seems to have come from Canadian lumber camps of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And that brings us to part one. Part one, the man who plucked the gorby. The woodsmen who ventured into the deep woods of New Brunswick could count on two things to keep them company, the biting winter wind and the clever Canada jay. Both were insistent in their companionship, but one was decidedly more welcome than the other. The cold would sap your strength, and the wind could drive you mad. The jays, on the other hand, were friendly, if insistent. They seemed oddly at home in the camp, and many of the men recognized a kindred spirit in the brazen little birds. They would watch with curiosity from the boughs of the trees, and when something struck their interest, they would swoop down and take it. They wouldn't have to wait long, because they were interested in almost everything, especially food. They were the uninvited guests at every meal, and often the first to sample the fare stealing scraps from a quarry, bacon from the fry pan, even bits of bait right from the traps. Toss them a scrap of crust to stave them off, and they'd try to snatch the entire sandwich from your hands. But they always left on friendly terms, flying away with a happy chirp once their bellies were full. In the camps, they were mostly known as gorbies. That's G-O-R-B-E-Y. No one knows exactly why, but one folklorist theorized that it comes from the Scottish-Irish word gorb, meaning both a glutton or a greedy person or animal, as well as an unfledged bird. Others suspect that it might be a corruption of the Scottish word corby, with a C, which means raven or crow. Whatever the case, most of the woodsmen agreed that the gorby was special, some of that came from solidarity. They shared the same space, the same freezing weather, and the same appetite. But it was also the fact that the birds seemed so at home in the camps, so friendly and fearless, that many were convinced that behind those glossy black eyes was the spirit of one of their own. Gorbys carried the souls of a dead woodsman. Ask someone in camp and there was a good chance they'd tell you, when a hunter or a lumberman died in those woods, his soul would go into those birds, and he would continue to seek out the food and company of his comrades and the warmth of the bunkhouse. However you treated it would come back to you in equal measure. Feed one, and you would not want for food. Treat one well, and you'd prosper. Harm one, and you yourself would be harmed. Stories confirming this fear could be found throughout the forest, one told how a man kicked a gorby while it was trying to steal his lunch and broke its leg. The next day, the man's leg was fractured when he caught his foot in a trace chain. In another story, a man fractured his arm shortly after a well-aimed stick he had thrown broke a gorby's wing. Almost every camp seems to have had their own unique tale, inspired by people who lived there and the injuries they sustained. But there's one especially common story that everyone seemed to know, from Maine to Miramichi. It was a bleak night in February. The camp crew were crammed inside the bunkhouse, drinking, playing cards, and cursing the fierce winter storm that had kept them inside for three long, cold days. Even then, it showed no signs of weakening. The wind howled just beyond the door. It scratched at the walls and blew through the gaps and down the chimney, making the firelight flicker. A man sat at a rough wooden table with a bottle of whiskey in one hand and a creased playing card in the other. A messy game of solitaire was spread out before him, along with a half-eaten bowl of stew that had chilled into a gelatinous heap. His attention was fixed on the world outside. The bunkhouse window was a cataract eye, and the shadows of trees bent and twisted in its milky dark. He knew that, somewhere beyond, swallowed by the storm, set the camp's meager stack of timber. It lay like a memory, buried beneath a thick blanket of snow on the unseen banks of the frozen river. He felt a pang of desperation jolt through his chest. No chance to work meant no logs on the river, 
which meant no pay at the end of the season. A gentle tapping on the window pane brought his attention back into the hollow warmth of the bunkhouse. He looked down and saw a gorby standing on the outer sill, its chest puffed up to combat the cold. The man sneered and, ignoring the little bird, turned back to his game. But the tapping came again. He frowned and waved a frantic hand toward the window to shoo it away, but the bird remained unfazed. After a moment's hesitation, it tapped a third time. Giving a growl of anger, the man threw down his card and flung open the window. A gust of wind raced inside. Its invisible, jagged form raked across the man's hands, making him wince. Before he or anyone else knew what he was doing, the man shot forward and caught the bird in his hands. Holding his scarred fingers like pliers, he proceeded to pluck every last feather from the creature's body. They caught on the wind and drifted through the bunkhouse like snow. When he was done, he tossed the naked Gorby outside, snarling, Go, you son of a bitch, and get you a new coat. Then he slammed the window shut. No one dared to speak. They knew that what he had done was more than cruel. It was reckless. Everyone knew that the Gorbys held the souls of other woodsmen who had passed on. If he could do such a thing to them, or if you didn't believe that superstition to a helpless bird, there was no telling what he might do to others in the camp. Some felt compelled to admonish him, but they knew a greater power would punish him soon enough. The camp woke the next morning to whimpers of pain coming from the man's bunk. When they approached, they discovered that the man was completely hairless. Every strand, not just from his head, but from his eyebrows, beard, and body, even his nose, lay on his pillow and mattress. His skin was rough and red and torn in places, as if the hair had been yanked out by the roots. The look on his face suggested he had felt each and every one. He was given a day to recover and then exiled from the camp. It was as much for his safety as it was for the crew. He had broken a natural law of the wilderness, and while some worried his mere presence would bring misfortune to those around him, Others felt compelled to personally continue his punishment in a line with their own ideas of justice. The story quickly spread from camp to camp, and his hair never grew back, so unable to hide the physical mark of his curse, of his cruelty and his shame, he was forced to wander the woods for the rest of his life. Until the day he died, he would rely on the compassion of strangers, working odd jobs, staying only a single night at each camp, and begging for food, just like the bird he had harmed. Even years after his death, his story continued to be shared as a lesson for the younger generations about the importance of equality, generosity, and kindness, the dangers of selfishness and cruelty, and the mystery of the natural world and its laws. What goes around comes around, they say. Few people learned that lesson better than the man who plucked the Gorby. Different variations of this story were once a staple of nearly every logging camp raconteur, both in eastern Canada, in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, and in the U.S., in places like Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York. Today, it's mostly known as a legend of Maine, but folklorists are almost certain it originated in New Brunswick. In some versions, the man who breaks the unspoken law and harms the Gorby is a nameless villain who is battered, bloodied, and either killed or cast out from his community. In others, he is a well-known member of the camp who is easily recognized due to his lack of hair. In these cases, the legend served as a bit of entertaining, over-the-top camp gossip to explain how and why that particular individual lost their hair. It might sound silly, but stories can be powerful, especially when accompanied by compelling visual aids, and a significant number of people who shared the story admitted that they believed it. 
Folklorist Edward Ives was surprised by the sheer number of people he interviewed who would end their retellings with statements like, that really happened, sir, or that's not a story, that's a fact. And many claimed that they had first heard the story from a friend or family member who was a direct eyewitness. Certainly, many more were skeptical. But even if it was hard to believe a story about an alopecian avian abuser, it was likely much easier to believe in the superstition itself. The idea that birds can embody the souls of the dead is an ancient one, found in many cultures across history and around the world, from ancient Egypt to Siberia. An old sailor superstition, originating in Europe but also found in Atlantic Canada, tells that seagulls are the spirits of dead sailors, which in a way makes them a sort of coastal cousin of the gorby. I think the Gorby's, or Canada Jays, personality plays into it as well. Despite their incessant attempts to steal everything in sight, most people who encounter them can't help but admire them. One of my favorite quotes about the Canada Jay comes from the American environmentalist Joseph Trimble Rothrock, who wrote, quote, His dishonesty is above suspicion. It is clear and positive. He will steal anything of yours that he can carry away, no matter whether he can use it or not." End quote. If you've ever met a Canada Jay in the wild, you may have been struck with how friendly and trusting they are, especially compared to other birds. They'll land on your hand or on your head if you let them, and seem perfectly at ease, as if you've somehow met before. And I feel that's what has really contributed to the longevity of the belief that it's good luck to treat the bird well, and bad luck to treat it poorly. Long after the lumber camps closed and the woodsmen left the forests, the core message endured, passed down from one generation to the next. The Canada Jay is somehow special and needs to be respected and protected. And they weren't the first to feel that way. Long before any European set foot on these shores, the indigenous people of the forests came to a similar conclusion. Hello, hello, I'm Malik. I'm Jamie. And this is World Gone Wrong, where we discuss the unprecedented times we're living through. Can your manager still schedule you for night shifts after that werewolf bit you? My ex-boyfriend was replaced by an alien body snatcher, but I think I like him better now. Who is this dude showing up in everyone's old pictures? My friend says the sewer alligators are reading maps now. When did the kudzu start making that humming sound? We are just your normal millennial roommates processing our feelings about a chaotic world in front of some microphones. World Gone Wrong, a new fiction podcast from Audacious Machine Creative, creators of Unwell, a Midwestern Gothic mystery. Learn more at audaciousmachinecreative.com. Find World Gone Wrong in all the regular places you find podcasts. I love you so much. <laughs> I mean, you could like up the energy a little you bit. You could like, up the energy. I actually don't take notes. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You sounded great. So did you. <laughs> Part 2. Names and Histories To get a good impression of the cultural impact of the Canada Jay, you need only to look at the long list of names it has earned over the years, over 30 in total, that speak to a special understanding of the bird and its nature. We already know the name Gorby, which is now rather obscure. Some of the more common are Meat Bird, Moose Bird, Carrion Bird, and Venison Hawk, which all attest to the jay's remarkable ability to find food. There are countless stories of it appearing out of nowhere as soon as a hunter has fired a shot at a moose or deer, or even leading hunters in song to their quarry in exchange for a share of the meal. Another common nickname is Camp Robber, which touches on that endearing tendency to try to steal everything in sight. The most common nickname by far has to be Whiskey Jack. It's actually an anglicized variation of a Cree word, which makes the Canada Jay the only bird in Canada that is commonly referred to by a traditional indigenous name. Now, a lot of people say that Whiskey Jack is a corruption of the word Wisakishak, which is the name of a Cree cultural hero and legendary figure, and essentially means a mischievous, transforming spirit who likes to play tricks on people. 
But that seems to be based on a misinterpretation. According to a number of sources, including the Cree Dictionary, the Canada J has three similar-sounding names depending on the region of the speaker. Wiskikak, Wiskakan, and Weskuchanis. Folk etymology tells us that those last two are also the words for blacksmith and little blacksmith, presumably because both the bird and blacksmith are the color of soot. Settlers embraced the name, and for a while, the bird was known as Whiskey John. Somewhere along the way, John turned to Jack, likely because in animal names, Jack can often mean small, as in the names of other birds like Jackdaw or Jacksnipe. Thus, Whiskey Jack essentially means little blacksmith. So there, now you too can be that person at your next dinner party. All joking aside, Knowing these names helps us find and collect all the different stories that are out there that, at first glance, might seem like they're about completely different birds. Once you realize they're about the same animal, you begin to see just how much of an impact that the friendly Canada Jay, or Moose Bird, or Whiskey Jack, has had on many different people, from many different cultures, from coast to coast. Now, it's important to note that the indigenous traditions about the Canada Jay should be treated a bit differently from the man who plucked the gorby. Though a good number of people who shared it believed that it was true, a good many more took it as nothing more than a legend, a bit of entertainment on a cold winter's night. It was also contemporary. At the time the tale was told, the events were said to happen in living memory, and often to a real person who the listener would likely recognize. That's not the case with these next stories. What you're about to hear aren't simply myths or tall tales. They're sacred legends about when the world was young, a time before time, and they're meant to teach us about why things are the way they are. Like this next story, found in both the Sandy Lake First Nation in northwestern Ontario and the La Rong Indian Band in north-central Saskatchewan. Shared by the late OG Cree artist Carl Ray in the book he co-authored, Sacred Legends of the Sandy Lake Cree, it helps to explain many characteristics of the Canada Jay, including its passion for borrowing things from others, its long wings and tail, its poor flying ability, and its refusal to fly south for the winter. All of these come from one fateful day long ago when the bird, Gwingwishi in Ojibwe, went to the well-known trickster transformer Wisakijak for advice. I've asked a friend who is an educator of Métis Cree descent to tell us the story. It is said that, long ago, the Whiskey Jack, or Quinguishe, was a very plain, very modest-looking bird. He was as gray as he is now, but with short wings, a stumpy little tail, and a slightly large but simple head. He was, in a word, boring, and Guinguiche hated being boring. The other birds of the forest were far more distinguished, with striking, colorful feathers, long, elegant necks, and graceful wings that carried them lightly on the wind, and they would often laugh at and mock their bland-looking brother. Finally, Guinguiche had enough of their ridicule and scorn. It was in the last days of autumn, in the month of the golden leaves, and all of the birds were getting ready for their yearly powwow before flying south for the winter. Guinguiche thought that if he could somehow change the way he looked, he could change what others thought about him, but he didn't know what to do. He flew all around the forest looking for an answer, until he saw Wasakajak, the great hero, napping at the base of a tree. Queen Quiche dove down through the air and lighted on a nearby branch. Wasakajak, he trilled. Big brother, can you help me? I'm too common and boring. The bird's powwow is coming up, and I want to look very important and handsome, but I don't know what to do. Wisakajak thought for a while, then answered, Go and borrow some feathers from the other birds and put them on your coat. Then you will be very handsome. Quinquiche was delighted by the idea. 
He flew all around the forest and borrowed a feather from each and every bird until he had enough to fashion a fine long tail, two strong wide wings, and a warm fluffy breast. Now he was distinctive and so handsome the others were sure to be impressed. The time had come for the great powwow at the edge of the forest, and he was ready to make his big entrance. He flapped his new wings and took to the air once more, but this time with a power he had never felt before. He knew he was in trouble almost right away. His new wings and tail were impossible to maneuver. He couldn't fly level no matter how hard he tried. He would flap his wings and soar, then suddenly swoop down. If he turned over, he would plummet straight down. That's almost how he arrived at the powwow that day, sailing out of the sky and crashing to the ground. The other birds laughed and laughed, and just when he thought they were done, Nika, the Canada goose, spoke up. Why, how graceful you are, he said, setting off another fit of laughter. Poor Gwinguishe was mortified. He quickly retreated to the shadows of the forest and tried desperately to pluck his new feathers, but they wouldn't come out. He realized that they were permanent, and, faced with the fact that he would never fly well again, he decided to give up migration and remain in the forest forever. He does not associate with other birds now, but prefers spending his time close to any camp he can find, where people like us will keep him company. Hearing this story, we get a sense of the fondness that many people have for the bird, and the sympathy that many are inclined to show when it comes to their home in the dead of winter looking for food. And like with any good camp companion, that sympathy is reciprocated. In another story in the same book, titled Sympathy of the Whiskey Jack, the bird comes to the aid of a starving orphan girl who is lying helpless in the snow. Finding her alone and freezing, he magically grows in size and carries her on his back to safety, saving her life. All he asks in return is a promise that she will share part of her food with him for the rest of her life. Do this, he says, and you will live to have white hair like mine. The girl agrees, and every day for the rest of her long and happy life, she goes to a secret place in the forest to feed her noble protector and thank him for his sympathy. A similar devotion has been observed far to the west as well, in the culture of the Dene people of the Upper Yukon. According to an oral tradition collected by folklorist Barry Judson, the Canada Jay, or Camp Robber as it's called in the tale, was once a medicine man who saved his people from starvation by manifesting a herd of caribou during a time of famine. To show their appreciation, the Camp Robber continues to be welcomed into their camps and communities to share in their meals, just as he once shared with them. Okay, one more name, one more story. And I think I saved the best for last. We've all grown up with at least some knowledge of the stars and their constellations, and I'm willing to bet that almost anyone can point out the Big Dipper, otherwise known as Ursa Major, in the night sky. In school, we're taught that Ursa Major is Latin for Greater Bear, and that it has its roots in Indo-European folklore. What's often left out is that the indigenous people of this continent, or Turtle Island, have their own stories of the stars. And for many, from the Cree to the Mi'kmaq to the Haudenosaunee, that shape is also a bear, known as Mista Musqua to the Cree and as Muin to the Mi'kmaq. The latter is the most well-known and most detailed version. The story takes a full year to play out as the constellation shifts through the night sky. It begins in the late spring, when the great bear wakes and leaves its cave. In some Cree versions, the bear is a tyrant and a killer, and the people decide to bring his reign of terror to an end. In the Mi'kmaq story, the bear is identified as a promising meal. Whether driven by justice or just an empty stomach, seven birds, who are also skilled hunters, come together to pursue the bear across the heavens, and each of them are represented by a star in the sky. It works like this. The business end of the Big Dipper, the ladle, is the bear, Muin. 
behind him are three stars that make up the handle. They are the robin, chickadee, and at the very tip, the Canada jay. Behind him, in the constellation that the Greeks called Boates, are pigeon, blue jay, barred owl, and northern sawit owl. The seven hunters start out from camp together and pursue the bear over the spring and summer months, but over time, they get separated. By the autumn, the last four hunters get tired and fall below the horizon, leaving Robin, Chickadee, and Canada Jay in hot pursuit. The hunt continues until late autumn, when Muin, exhausted from running for months on end, rears up on its hind legs, ready to defend itself. Sensing an opportunity, Robin fires an arrow from his bow and delivers a killing blow. Muin's blood spurts from the wound and splatters on the deciduous trees below, which is why their leaves always turn red in the fall. Robin gets covered in the great bear's blood as well, and with the help of Chickadee, who arrives just moments later, he manages to scrub himself clean, but his breast remains permanently stained. With Muin defeated, it's Chickadee's turn to get to work. The sharp-eyed bird was the first one to spot the bear and had immediately grabbed his cooking pot. Now it's finally time to use it. He builds a fire, preps the bear, and begins to cook. While all this is going on, Canada Jay is close behind, but he doesn't want to get involved just yet. He knows that if he shows up now, he'll be put to work. So he hangs back, bides his time, and when the meal is ready, he appears out of nowhere to snap up his share of the food. It's a life-changing experience for Canada Jay, and he decides then and there that he will never go hunting again. Instead, he'll continue to merely follow hunters, wait for the right moment, and then share the spoils. That is why, to the Mi'kmaq, the Canada Jay is known as Nikjakokish, he who comes in at the last moment. With the food cooked, it's time for the birds to share a meal, an act that reminds us that we're all related, that we should all share what we have, and that we should give thanks to the Creator and to each other for all that we have. Now, if this were like any standard story, it would end here. But this is a star tale, a cyclical tale. Slowly, over the winter months, the lifeless body of Muin moves through the sky and back to its den, where its spirit enters a new bear. And when spring arrives, the celestial hunt starts again. In his retellings, a Cree storyteller named Wilfred Buck informs us that the creator rewarded Robin for his heroics by giving the bird an egg as blue as the sky and a place of honor among the stars. There's no question that the real star of the story is Robin, but it's clear that Canada Jay plays a prominent role as well. The story certainly seems to give us the most insight about the bird's quirky character, and he still plays an important role as one of the three birds who successfully finished the hunt. Mr. Buck tells us that, after sharing this story, the elders would advise the youngest in the audience that they should never harm a robin because it is, quote, a creator's bird, end quote. And I wonder if the same could be said for Canada Jay. He, too, has his own star, after all, and, as we've seen, more than a few stories that tell us that he should be not just appreciated, but respected, protected, and honored. It's an idea that's as timeless and evergreen as the forest that the Canada Jay calls home, and its message may be needed now more than ever. Part 3. Culture and Climate it's easy to see how the Canada Jay has endeared itself to so many people from the time before time to the present day. It's true that some see Canada Jays as little more than winged pests who try to steal your dinner, but the people who have lived and worked around them long enough have found them to be much more than scavengers. They are survivors, like us. They think, they adapt, they endure. We can look at these birds and see ourselves looking back, a creature who, for better or worse, has made this land their home. Whatever we call this clever little bird, our stories about it teach us about the importance of sharing, respect, and seeing ourselves as part of the natural world. If we look out for nature, maybe she'll look out for us. 
As of this recording, the campaign to make the Canada Jay the nation's official bird has not yet been successful, but it has helped to improve public awareness of a remarkable creature that, for many, has flown under the radar. When the Royal Canadian Geographic Society first announced that the Canada Jay was their first choice for national stardom, many were confused, taking to social media to complain that they had never even heard of the thing, much less seen one. It could be that many of you listening right now felt the same way. The biggest reason, undoubtedly, is habitat. Most Canadians today don't live in the northern woods, but in cities that hug the southern border. However, there may be another, sadder reason why we're seeing less of the Whiskey Jack. Studies suggest that their numbers are decreasing due to climate change. The bird is a scavenger, but it's also a hoarder. In the months leading up to the first freeze of the year, they spend their time gathering berries, fungi, insects, and whatever else they can find, and then store all of it in little hiding spots scattered throughout their territory. When the temperature drops, the forest becomes a natural refrigerator now stocked with all their favorite foods that keeps them fed throughout the winter. But the climate has become increasingly unstable over the last few decades, and the greater frequency in freeze-thaw cycles is causing their food caches to spoil, which forces the birds to nest later in the year and have fewer offspring. The results have been staggering. A nearly 40-year study in Ontario's Algonquin Park shows that the Whiskey Jack population was cut in half between 1980 and 2018. Though some years saw fewer thaws and an increase in breeding, the population count remains low. The numbers are even worse in the states. According to an article in the newspaper The Timber Jay, the remote community of Isabella, Minnesota, once set a record for most Canada Jays on a count at 154. In 2023, they found only 19. It makes me think of those oral traditions I mentioned earlier of the Dene and the Sandy Lake Oji Cree, where the bird helped humanity and we, in turn, repaid the favor. It seems to me that it needs our help now more than ever. Does Canada really need an official national bird? I don't know. What I do know is that the Canada Jay is arguably the best candidate for the job. It's been a companion to the people of this land since long before it was a nation, both on earth and in the sky, enduring the same things that they had to endure, from blisteringly cold winters to severe ice storms to bouts of famine. Even today, as more Canadians struggle to find a home in a housing shortage or get enough to eat amidst rising inflation, the Whiskey Jack shares a similar experience with the greening of the Arctic and ongoing climate change. As all of the stories tonight seem to suggest, we are, in many ways, linked together. No matter where they live or what language they speak, people from coast to coast have seen something of themselves in this curious little bird, and in response, have folded it into their culture and identity. And why not? In the words of Dr. David Bird, it is friendly, smart, and perhaps most importantly, hearty. And what is more Canadian than that? That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening and for joining me in becoming part of a Canadian folk tradition. Now that you know the story, share it. And remember, if you ever encounter a Canada Jay or Whiskey Jack in the woods, be sure you treat it well. If the stories are any indication, you'll want to stay on its good side. Fireside Canada is written and recorded by me, David Williams, with sound design by Matt Kesselman. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our business manager. Jordan Heath Rawlings is our executive producer. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving this podcast a positive review. If you want to help even further, you can provide story ideas and more through my website. Every little bit helps to keep the fire burning and the library of legends growing. Learn more at firesidecanada.ca.
Hello, hello, I'm Malik. I'm Jamie. And this is World Gone Wrong, where we discuss the unprecedented times we're living through. Can your manager still schedule you for night shifts after that werewolf bit you? My ex-boyfriend was replaced by an alien body snatcher, but I think I like him better now. Who is this dude showing up in everyone's old pictures? My friend says the sewer alligators are reading maps now. When did the kudzu start making that humming sound? We are just your normal millennial roommates processing our feelings about a chaotic world in front of some microphones. World Gone Wrong, a new fiction podcast from Audacious Machine Creative, creators of Unwell, a Midwestern Gothic mystery. Learn more at audaciousmachinecreative.com. Find World Gone Wrong in all the regular places you find podcasts. I love you so much. I mean, you could like up the energy a little bit. You could up the energy. I actually don't take notes. Ah! (laughs) (laughs) That was good. I'm just kidding. You sounded great. So did you. (laughs)